this morning I, I have a message. Actually, it was the message I was going to preach on the Thursday night of conference. And uh, Melissa did a great job. She got up and she shared the vision. She shared the history and she exhorted the house and exhorted Linda, myself. And she did a wonderful job. And, and, uh, but I never got a chance to preach the message. And it was good. It was really good. And, and so I thought to myself, you know what? I am going to take the time this morning and share the message, the message of faith, the message the, that God put on my heart to close the conference off. I'm going to add some things to it because I, I covered some of it already. But I think it's so important that we really understand where we got to at the conference. See, at the conference, we hit a new level of church. And personally, I'm not going back. Personally, I don't want. See, human nature says, oh, I got through the conference. Now I can relax. And really what you're saying, now I can go back to what I did. I, my pastor used to be, uh, the pastor that I had before, Pastor Rick, he used to be an evangelist to the Pentecostal Church of Canada. And he had traveled steadily across Canada, and he'd do week-long revivals in, in the churches across Canada. And I never forget him telling me this. He says, you know, Mike, he says, I would go into the church, and he says, we'd, we'd go in, and my gift of the evangelist would stir up. We'd get people saved. We'd have miracles. We'd have healings, and the power of God would be there. And we'd have seven days of revival and everything like that. And it was awesome, and, and the people were so excited. But when I ba went back the next year, they hadn't kept it up. They let it slide. They let it go. They'd gone back to the old ways. And he said, here I am stirring it up again. But after a while, he says, it got, kind of, it got kind of frustrating for me because I was getting them up to a level, but then they fell right back to the old level. As soon as, they, as soon as the conference was over, they started going back to where they were at before. And people know that's not God's plan. God's plan is glory to what? Glory to glory to glory. Amen? God's plan is that we're always increasing. We're always getting more. And going more and higher with him all the time. Amen? That's God's plan. But see, human nature, oh, don't. Uh, in a way, I hate human nature. Do you hate human nature? Because human nature always works in the negative of what God wants us to be. We always fall back. If we're not pushing, we always fall back to human nature. Man will do what man will do. Amen. Human nature. You know, and when you think of this, how, how, how we, we, we really have to purpose. This is my message today. We really have to purpose to get to know God. We have to purpose to run after things of God. And I found out this would be 35 years of me serving the Lord I got saved on, on, night, on November of 1989, and so for 35 years, I have been serving the Lord. And, you know, I've always tried, always purposed to keep going up. I've never backslid. I've never not tithed. I've never, I've never just, just got, said, well, God, I'm going to take a year off. I've never stopped reading the Word. I've never stopped praying the Word. I've never stopped believing by faith. And see, it was just, it's, it's, a, it's a constant lifestyle of going higher. Amen? And some people say, well, well, why are you so blessed? Because I've never quit. I've never quit pressing. It's in my nature to press. I know I'm an A personality. You say, you're choleric, Pastor Mike. You're an A personality. I get that. But I don't think it's because I'm a choleric. I don't think it's because of an A personality. It's because I'm hungry. It's because I'm hungry for more. I want more. I want to know the love of God. I want to know the peace of God. I want to know no matter what's going on in this world, God has got this. God, it's going to be okay because I'm with God. And that's what I want to get to you this morning. If you're online, if you're in person, if you're on the rewatch, I want to get to you this morning that it's, that, that it's, it's so important that we run with God, that we go with God that we never let up, that we never back down, that we never get into doubt. We don't let the fear, of, the fear of man, the fear of this world ever really have any type of effect 
on our decision-making process. And it's a learning curve. It's a learning process. Amen? Hallelujah. So what happened at our conference? What happened at our conference? Well, here's what I believe happened. We had five days of sustained revival. I want you to understand that because I'm a student of revival, and I've always been in search of revival. And, I, and, I, and I've always wanted to say, God, what is real revival like? And you know what I, think, I really truly believe with all my heart? I'm not just because it was our conference, but the power of God, the results, the fruit. And anyone who, who was here through it all, you know what I'm talking about. I had never experienced something like that over five days in all my ministry time. I've been around the world. I've seen great things happen. Don't get me wrong. I'm not just saying because it's, it's in our house it happened. But I'm telling you, in all my years of ministry, I've never seen five days of sustained power of Holy Ghost revival. Amen? And, and, and some of us are, have been talking about this, and I've been talking to Pastor Rick about this. I was talking to Sammy Robinson about this. He's still stoked about it. Barry Miracle still send me videos about this. This was powerful. I'm still getting videos from Barry Miracle. You know, these guys are stoked because something happened here in this conference that hasn't been happening around and across this nation. And they know about it, and they're making plans, and they're wanting to come back, and they, we're talking conferences next year, and we're already talking. we got to see what God is up to. Amen? And so don't, don't just, oh, I'm on summer holidays, Pastor. I'll get excited in September. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, I'm just got, I, you know, Pastor, I, I just got, you know, I'm tired. I just got to take a break. I just got to do this. Oh, God, I was, so, I was so tired for five days of conference. I just have to take three months to recover. Don't do that. Don't do that. I know. I, I put Pastor Rick and Kathy on the plane at, 10, at, at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning after the conference, and I got home, and I was sitting on the couch, and I was tired, and I went to bed, and I slept for two hours, but then I was good again. I did. I, 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 don't, I don't nap. I never nap. But I did on Saturday for two hours. But I was good again. I'm not in recovery mode now. Do I look like I'm in recovery mode? Do I sound like I'm in recovery mode? No. I'm going up and over mode right now. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so, so I believe when the, the God entitled it, the best is yet to come, he showed us what it could be like on a sustained amount of time. And I'm already building teams. I'm already putting teams together because I believe the next time it comes, it's not going to stop. So I'm already getting teams together, more worship teams, more people, more pastors, more, to, more leaders. We're already starting to build teams so when this thing comes the next time, we ain't stopping. We're going to have teams in place so I don't have to take those naps on Saturday morning to recover. Or Saturday afternoon. Amen? Because God's up to something. And it's called the end time revival. I thought you'd be more happy with that. Praise the Lord. Don't you realize that like half of Canada has to get born again? Don't you realize that that's like 18 million people? And we're less, we're like a million or so now? There's a, there's, don't you realize there has to be a major revival to sweep across this nation? And millions upon millions of souls must get saved. And this is what God is up to. And he gave us a little, a little light, a little bit of it. Amen? And so I want, you to, I want to talk to you about this. See, what the, the, the topic of our conference was the best is yet to come. But this morning I want us to continue our preparation for the best that is going to come. Because we experience the best is yet to come for five days, but the best is going to come, is going to springboard off that and go in, in, in greater heights, in greater place. We're going to see wonderful things happen. I want you to see this. I want you to get excited with this. Let me pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father. I praise you. I thank you, Father, for what you're about to do. Father, we give you glory for what you did at that conference, but that's over. But now, Father, we have to put preparation in place for the, the best that's going to come. 
And we know, Father, you have these plans. We know it's been prophesied. You, we understand. We read our Bible, and we know there's an end-time harvest, Lord, of proportions that we've never seen before, Lord. And we know that we're in these last days, Lord. We understand, Father, hallelujah, by the signs of the times. Jesus says that, that we should understand the signs of the times, and we know by the signs of the times that things are happening quickly right now. So, Father, prepare our hearts. I pray for the people of Capital City Church that we would be aware. That we would recognize the importance of making you our number one priority. That we would, we would come to the place of forsaking all and following you. And we just get rid of our busyness and get ourselves aligned with you. Amen? Amen? You know, summer's a great time for me. If you saw my garage, it's kind of embarrassing, I keep the door down. If you saw my garage and my trailer and other places, you'd see Pastor Mike loves summer by the number of toys he has in his garage. You know, motorcycles, more than one. ATVs, side by side, boats, old car. It's just, I got a lot. I like, I like, it. my motto has been for years if it burns gas, I like it. Amen? I even like driving a lawn tractor because it's burning gas. Amen? I love summer. I love summer. But my Mustang is a nice Mustang. 25 years old, Ford GT Mustang, black fastback. Big tires. It's a nice Mustang. It hasn't seen 100 miles yet this year. My antique motorcycles, they're in the garage collecting dust. They haven't seen 100 miles. My main bike has only seen 300 miles so far. And the boat just hit the water last week. I haven't got time for toys. And I'm okay with it. And I'm okay with it. Because what God is up to is more important than me enjoying my toys this summer. Now, I'll get out on some of them. Don't worry. Don't feel bad for me. Amen? You say, I don't. I wish I had them. No, but don't feel bad. I'm doing good. But I'm telling you that there's a priority in my life that is more important than the things I have. What I saw in the conference changed my priorities and if they don't get out much this summer, that's okay. Because there's a priority called the presence of God that has, that has, that has taken charge in my life. Amen? And so, and so I just want you to see how important this is to me. And I hope it becomes important to you that no matter what you think has been important, presence has to become a priority. Amen? presence. That's why Ecclesiastes was so important on, on that Thursday night. And I said that, and it's amazing the number of people who told me after that, I've never seen that scripture, and I never had either. But let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18 again. Solomon, the book of Ecclesiastes, a lot of people don't read it, but it's a very fun book to read. Amen? And I, I get a kick out of it. And so, if, if even chapter, uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 18 even so, I have noticed one thing, at least that is good. It's good for people to eat, drink, enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them. So it's okay to enjoy this stuff. It's okay for me to have toys to enjoy. It's okay to ride motorcycles. It's okay to have ATV boats. It's great. It's awesome. Enjoy them. Amen? When you can. Amen? Now, it's given them. And to accept their lot in life, the calling and grace upon their life. The lot in life is the calling of God and the grace, the giftings, the talents upon your life. So you got to accept who God made you to be. Verse 19. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and, the, and good health to enjoy it. So wealth, the blessing of God, and good health. How many of you know that's what life is really about? When you are blessed and have good health to enjoy your blessing... That truly is the blessing of God. Now, wealth is, it includes money, but it's more than money. 
Because you can have money but no peace. Or you can have money and no health. So don't get all wrapped up in money. The world's wrapped up in money and assets and all this other stuff. Don't get caught up in money. Money will drive you crazy. And the, pro and the thing the Bible says about money is it'll disappear. If money is your God, money will disappear on you. Amen? The Bible says don't be a lover of money. Money's just a tool. Money's just a tool. It's a bartering system. In the old days, they didn't use money. They brought a chicken, and they picked up a loaf of bread or two. They bartered everything. Amen? I love bartering. But all money is is an easy way to barter. You go to the store, and they say, if you want those steaks, those steaks are $15. So you say, I, so you're really bartering. You say, I have $15, and I'm going to buy those steaks. I get to eat steaks because I, I had $15. Amen? So really, money isn't all that important. And if anything, the new Gen Z and, and the younger millennials, they, they have lost their value of money because it's just a plastic card now. And when, and when, you, when you pay everything with a plastic card, you have no value of money. A dollar is, is only a tool. It's just, and maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, I don't know. But, but to me, money, it's not about money. You've got to get money, the, the concept of money out of your head. Amen. And we're blessed and we're prosperous and everything like that. But, but it's not about that. Amen. And then it says to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. To enjoy. So Solomon says it's good that you enjoy your work, what God has called you to do. Accept your lot in life again, the grace that's upon your life. This is indeed a gift from God. That's important, you see. So God's gift to you is to live this life serving Him, and you will enjoy it. See, why don't people enjoy the life? Why is there so much hopelessness out there? Why is there so many people stressed, depressed, oppressed? Why is that? Because they're not enjoying their life. Why are they not enjoying their life according to Scripture? Because they're not living their life according to God's plan. It's simple. And the more we align our life with God's plan and forget about our plan the more we start enjoying life. Now, this is not rocket science, but it's just plain truth. And I can, I can just, I only got my life as an example, but I have lived this for 35 years. And I had some young preacher come up to me one time just a little while ago, and he says to me, Pastor Mike, how come you're so happy after pastoring all these years? As if you're not supposed to be happy when you pastor a long time. I said, because I love life. I'm doing exactly what God told me to do. For 35 years, I've been living, running after God, doing it. And God has blessed the work of our hands, and God has kept me healthy. And everything in this scripture has come to pass. That's why I love this scripture so much. Watch this now. Verse 20 is what got my attention. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life. What such people? you got to make sure you understand. God keeps such people. What such people? Those people who, have, who enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. God keeps those people, come on now, so busy enjoying life that they don't have time to brood over the past. It's so powerful. If you're really running after the things of God, the presence of God, the Word of God, you're in church, you're volunteering, you're leading people to the Lord, you're about the Father's business, you're just having a great life, whatever career, whatever job God's given you, you're, you know you're there for the glory of God. You're just enjoying going through life, staying busy with God, that you don't have time to think about all the hurts of the past, the, the fears of the past, the, the burdens of the past, the junk of the past, the people did this, and he said that, and she said that. You don't even have time to think about that. And, you know, I've always been that way. It didn't matter. Whatever people have done, if you're in ministry for 35 years, you met some crazy people. You've, you've had some people do some crazy things, say some crazy things. Something, I can't believe people actually get mad at me sometimes. I'm a nice guy. What are you mad at me for? You know, and, and the more you talk faith, the more people tend to get mad at you. But see, we've got to understand. See, I, I didn't understand this, but see, that, that really what the, the people get upset about is you're having too much fun, and they're not. You're enjoying your life too much, and they're not. Amen? And, 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 and I've, I've been kind of, even I go to conferences, and, and people say, you're always happy. I say, well, 
What's the option? You're always talking faith. What's the option? Amen? See, see, we have to be enjoying the life that God has given us, amen, so we don't get caught up in all the junk of the past. Praise the Lord. And so, so we have to understand this. Hallelujah. We have to make sure that we're understanding what God is up to. And I, I've, been, I've been so caught up in this lately that I just think, God, you're, you're just amazing. Amen? Praise the Lord. We've got to learn how to be blessed. This is what I want to talk to you about. It doesn't just happen because you get born again. I found out, and I think you've all found out if you've been walking with the Lord. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't you wake up every morning and you're blessed. It, it takes effort. It takes determination. It takes, it takes longevity. It takes purpose to do any, any success in life, saved or unsaved. It takes purpose. It takes, it takes a decision every day to serve the Lord. Amen? And see, that's what I want to talk to you about, how important it is that we are taking and making this a priority in our lives. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, if we look at this, how we've learned to be blessed and how we can learn to be blessed. I came across this scripture as I was reading my Bible because I purpose read my Bible every morning. Oh, well, that's you. You're a pastor. No, no, no. As a restaurant owner, I purposed every morning. And as a restaurant owner, I purpose to pray every morning. Can I tell you something? It was more important for me to pray and read my Bible as a restaurant owner than a pastor. Because as a restaurant owner, I dealt with, everyone I dealt with was unsaved. Very, very few Christians came into my restaurant. Amen? Few from the church would show up every once in a while. But overall, 99% of my customers in the restaurant were unsaved. Amen? And if you're in business, you've ever been in business for a season, or, or you understand that there's many, many challenges to be in business. So let me tell you, don't ever think, well, you're the pastor. Of course you read your Bible. No. I needed to be in my Bible more as a businessman, and I can honestly say it, than a pastor, because as a pastor, I'm surrounded by you guys. You're Christians. You love me, don't you? Yes, you do. Praise the Lord. And, and because, because that, it's easier to be a pastor in, in the presence of a bunch of Christians all the time, amen, than it is to be a business person surrounded by non-Christians. So when I'm telling you to read your Bible every day, it's not just, oh, well, that's because he's a pastor. Don't fall for that trap. You need to be in your word every day to live your life, no matter what your call is, no matter what your gift is. Amen? So I'm reading my Bible, Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. His disciples, Jesus' disciples, came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but others are not. Watch this now. Here's the principle. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. See the key here? To those who take the time to listen. You know, when you read the Gospels, how many times Jesus said, listen, hear. So often he was telling, and what he's really saying, stop. Stop your busyness. Take time to listen to my teaching. And the more you study my word and pray and are in church and going about my business, the more understanding or revelation will be given. And then you will have an abundance of knowledge. Verse 12. But to those who are not listening or don't take time to listen, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That's a spiritual law, you see. Spiritual laws are important to understand because you and I have to understand it's, we have to take the time to read, study, pray. We have to take the time to do that. We can't ever say we're too busy. Have you used that excuse before or it's just me? I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. What are you too busy at that you got 24 hours in a day? You can't take 20 minutes to read your Bible. Amen. 
Sometimes you just got to slap yourself upside the head and say, that's stupid. That's a stupid excuse. Turn off that TV. Or even put it on mute through commercials and get your Bible reading in in two hours through commercials. Amen? Do something that's different that you can make sure that you're feeding your mind with the Word of God. Do something that's different that you can determine, I am going to be a person of personal prayer. I am going to find my secret place because God says, Jesus said, if you, if you pray in secret, God will reward you openly. But if you don't pray in secret, there's no open reward. Spiritual law. Amen. See, so Jesus says, for those who do listen this, for those who don't listen that. So busyness, my friends, busyness. Busyness is one of the main attacks of Satan against Christians. Amen? And the world. Busyness. We cannot let busyness take us away from the time in his presence. See, busyness is a curse. And it's time that we start recognizing that you and I cannot look at our lives Align our lives up to the world. We can't look at the world and say, oh, I want to be like that person. If that person is not saved, you do not want to be like that person. Oh, I just wish I had that person. If I was just not, had that notoriety. No, you don't want that notoriety if that person is not saved. You want to be who God's called you to be, and you want to be taking time with God in his presence as, no, as top Number one priority. And you never want to make an excuse why you can't read your Bible, why you can't pray, why you can't come to church, why you can't volunteer, why you can't witness, why you can't do the things that God has called you to do. You can never, ever make an excuse against that. Amen? Because if you do, your priorities are out of balance. And the funny thing about God, so some people say, oh, pastor, that's just extreme. That's just so extreme, Pastor. How do you ever expect me to live that way? Well, Romans 12, 1 calls that reasonable service. He doesn't call that extreme. He calls that reasonable service. And let me tell you what will happen. Your life will get better. You will start enjoying the life that God has given you, and you will start forgetting about the things of the past that are bothering you if you'll just do a simple thing like this. Amen? Now, here's, here's something God showed me that this, and that's why one, one point I wanted to get across to you today. So there's some people and some things can bring us happiness, but true peace and joy only comes from Jesus. My friends, some people think they want happiness, but you're really looking for peace and joy. You know, things, I can be happy. I can get on my motorcycle, go for a ride, come back happy. It's, it's nice. It's nice wind blowing through. It's nice zoom, 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 zoom through the curves. It's fun. It's nice. I can be happy. But the happiness is over within an hour of coming home. Happiness cannot sustain me. Happiness cannot be my life. If I'm running after happiness, then I'm looking for all kind, everything that will make me physically happy. But see, happiness is not the key. Peace and joy should be your goal. Joy is strength. Peace surpasses all understanding. This is what we want to do. And this is what the conference was really about, you see, to understand this. Praise the Lord. And here's the purpose of the message. I haven't really mentioned the title yet because I wanted to get to that. But what I really want to talk to you on the Thursday night at conference was knowing the still, small voice of God. Because, you see, I've come to know something because I guess I'm getting older. I guess, no guess, I am getting older. And, and, and people say, well, so what is key? What, 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 what has helped you so much? And, and what, wh why are you successful? Because they recognize we are a certain level of success. And I said, here's my number one. Say number one. Not five. Not five keys to success. The one key I have to success that I've, I have developed through time with God is I know the still, small voice of God. 
every success that this church has had, that I have had personally since I got born again, has come from hearing the whisper, from hearing the thought, the still, small voice of God. Amen? See, people are running here and there. They want to get a prophetic word. They want to get this one to say, tell them what they have to do. Do this, do that, go here, go there. And prophetic words, we had two prophets in. They were wonderful, praise the Lord. They were, and, and we had the pastors in. We had the apostles in. We had all the fivefold ministry in our church over the And it was wonderful. But see, here's the deal, my friends. All those ministries are not there to tell you what God has said. The prophet's job is not to tell you what God has told you to do. He said, well, well why am I running all over the country to get a prophetic word then? I, I could ask you that question. <laughs> but the prophet is important. The apostle is important. The pastor is important. What is their job? Their job is to confirm the word that you got in the still small voice. Amen? I can't tell you how many people have run from prophet to prophet and, the, and that they get so many words they just end up confused. I said to one guy, after he ran from prophet to prophet, he had five different journals full of prophetic words over his life. He was an older pastor at the time. I said, but what has God asked you, John? He says, I don't have a clue. And we laugh, but it was sad. It was tears were coming to our eyes. Because he'd run his race, lived his life, not knowing what God has said to do. But see, what I tell people, and, and I even talked to Joe Weiss at Canada Cope Ministries, and I said, he says, will you come out to Burnaby? Go, he wants me to go to Burnaby, B.C. to do a chapel with the Bible school. That's a long way to go do chapel. And I said, I know exactly what I'm going to teach the students. How to know the still, small voice of God. He says, you come, you come, you do that. He says, they need that. Now, watch this now. 1 Kings chapter 19. This is God speaking to Elijah. Then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks to pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. The Lord was in the still, small voice. And I can tell you that the still, small voice has been the thing for 35 years that has directed my life. Halfway through Bible school, 1995. I've got some driving for you to do. My pastor comes in a couple months later. Mike, we've got some driving for you to do. Well, we went up to Northern Ontario, Long Nut, took care of a church for 12 weeks, restored a church in 12 weeks. Then we came back in 1996 in a prayer meeting. My pastor says, here's 10 cities I want to plant churches in. Ask the Lord, which one's yours? Linda was at the front of this 22,000-foot sanctuary. I was at the back. I said, Lord, what city is ours? Linda said the same thing. Lord told us both, Guelph. We went up there. Lord spoke to the dean of the Bible school. Send Mike and Linda to Guelph. Still small voice. Walked up to our pastor at 3.30 in the afternoon. We're sitting in the foyer. Pastor comes up. He says, I know where God send you. I said, we do too. He says, how do you know? Have you talked to George? I said, no, the Lord told us. Where? He says, God told us, send us to Guelph. He told me that too, he says. And everything was in agreement. 
two and a half years there in a service, February 21st, 1999. I'm buying my own business. I'm just buying my own business. Things are going good in Guelph. Everything's going wonderful. We're just thinking this is great. I'm 45 minutes from my family. There's 45 minutes from her family. You couldn't get any better. It's where I went to university. Everything's good. Everything's perfect. Let's stay in Guelph. Let's just get. Let's just grow the church in Guelph. Everything's going great. God says, i got to move for you. After 30 minutes of fear, I said, where? He said, move to Ottawa. Take over Word of Life Church. Amen? Then I went to my pastor. Then I went to the prophet. Then I went to the, the, the apostle. Then I went and said, we get here. God says, God says after, after six, eight, nine months here, he says, now go buy me some property. I said, give me a break. I just got here. I wasn't in faith that time. I just like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting going here. You want me to buy property? Three days later, we find this property, 87 acres. I said, Lord, he said, he said, I said, this is the property. Still a small voice, buy me that land. Then he says to me, starts filling the blanks. And don't go to the banks. They're not going to loan you any money. You've got to believe for every cent yourself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. A few years later, he says, now build me a building. I said, I had all these great plans. I was going to start with trailers because they're cheap. He says, I'm not into trailers. Okay, we'll build 6,000 feet. That's not big enough. 7,500 feet. That's not big enough. 10,000 feet. That's not big enough. We're negotiating here, me and God. 12,5. Is that okay? No. 15,000. That's what I want you to build. I said, okay. No trouble at all. Just build a fit. Mark, just build a 15,000 foot building brand new, and you won't even in town for a few years. He says, yeah, do it. And he did it. Six years later, he paid it all off for us. See, when you're in the will of God, see, in one day in 2011, this church paid off $1.564 million. And we were debt free. Amen? See, it's because we heard the voice of God. Amen? And see, what, I, what I'm teaching this is because I want you to learn this. I want this church to be your model. I want you to know you can get your mortgage paid off. Supernaturally. You can buy a house when everyone says you can't buy a house. You can live at a lifestyle that most people say is impossible today. You can live in covenant with God, and God is your source. The still small voice is so important. It's been the number one key to success in my life. And I believe it's the number one key to every Christian's life. If you can know the voice of God, the thoughts of God, and the word of God to line up with your thoughts and the words you're getting, then you will succeed with God. Amen? Praise the Lord. I was talking to Sam, Sammy Robinson just last night, and he basically, he was telling me, this is what the Lord's saying. He says, it's all about the still, small voice of God, Mike. You hear the still, he's, he's prophesying me, you hear the still, small voice of God. Sammy, I'm preaching that tomorrow morning. Praise God. You know, Sammy's up all the time, you know. Praise God. Amen. He started, he, started, he started going over and getting the points to this sermon as I was talking to him on the phone. Amen. Because it's so vitally important. And I could go through testimonies. I could go for hours and hours. I could make a seminar and teach you all the different testimonies of hearing the still small voice of God. Every home we've got. We've had three homes in Ottawa. Every one of them, the still small voice of God has said, that's your next home. Driving by, look, he, it's like Lord says, look this way, that's your next home. Okay. Out in the country, that's your next home. Amen? Every, every, everything God has done is the still, small voice of God. And the cool thing is, if you don't hear it, don't do it. Here, here's the key. If you don't hear it, don't do it. Because even Jesus said, I don't do nothing. That my father doesn't tell me to do. I don't say anything that my father doesn't tell me how to say. So see, I, what I'm telling, telling you is what I learned from Jesus. Every Christian needs to operate like Jesus operates. That's why we're people of prayer, word, and presence driven. That's why we spend time with the Lord. We're open to the Lord, to hear from the Lord. Amen? I want you to see how important this is. Hallelujah. Presence, say presence driven. You need, I need to be presence driven. 
Presence has to be my priority. The great generals in the faith, Smith Wigglesworth, you know, uh, 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 Lester Summerall, the great generals in the faith, John G. Lake, you know, they wouldn't even leave their homes in the morning until they were in the presence. Do you know that? They wouldn't. John G. Lake would not go out to do anything unless he had the presence of God, the tangible presence of God. He'd, he'd, he'd got hold of the presence of God through his prayer and his word. See, this is how Christians are to operate. And the fact that we, we so many Christians, they're going through life just giving God a little bit of time that they have, but not giving them priority, is mean they're not being led by the presence. And if you're not being led by the presence, you've been led by your flesh. And if you're led by your flesh, you're in trouble. The same trouble the rest of the world's in. You can be a Christian, born again, spiritual, tongue talking, and still be going through all the troubles of the world. Why? You're not taking time to be in his presence. Amen? And this is what the Lord's purpose of the conference was. He said, Mike, give me a five day conference. I said, Lord, no one does five day conference. Most people are two and a half days, maybe. You want me to go five days? He says, I want you to go five days. I said, why? He says, because if I can get the people into my presence, I can answer the prayers they've been praying to me. That's what he told me, the wisdom of being five days. And, you know, some of you couldn't make it all, but still next time, can I tell you? Next time, make it a priority to make everything that's going on. I mean, we had Monday morning at 10 a.m. Who would call a service at Monday morning at 10 a.m.? Who in their right mind would ever do a service at 10 o'clock on Monday morning? Well, God told me two morning sessions, 10 o'clock on Monday, 10 o'clock on Tuesday, 10 o'clock Monday morning. This sanctuary is three-quarters full of people who are hungry for the presence so I know God's doing something great in our lives. Amen? Amen? Be presence-driven. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life, the path of your life, the route that you're supposed to take. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures for every more, every more. See, See, there's a path. You're guided down your path by his presence. And when you're in his presence on the right path, you're living with fullness of joy, not just half joy. You're living in fullness of joy, amen, and pleasures evermore. See, the world says, oh, you deserve to do this. You know, take a line of cocaine, take, take, take 12 pack of beer, have a shot of scotch, of whiskey, and have some pleasure, have some fun. Come on, your, your Christians are just so boring. Have some fun. Oh, my friends, for 33 years of my life before I got saved, I tried, not the cocaine, never had cocaine, but I tried the booze. I tried way too much booze. All I ever woke up with the next morning was a big, bad hangover. And it took me sometimes two days to recover from that. All it did was steal my quality of life. Amen? Drugs do the same thing. All the all, all weird sex stuff there on the internet, that does all the same. It just steals your quality of life. What, what you're trying to get for pleasure is stealing your life. Sin will steal your life. Steal, the old saying we had, sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go and cost you more than you're ever willing to pay. Amen? And, and you say, well, I, 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 I'm happy, aren't I? Are you? Are you really happy in sin? Are you really happy? Do you really have the fullness of joy? No, you don't. And if you tell me you do, you're lying to me. Because sin does not give fullness of joy. See, we have to get our life back in order so we can have this fullness of joy, pleasures evermore, the blessing, the healing, the health, the, everything. We have to make sure we are purposing to get hold of this. Amen? You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. Amen? You, you know you're on his path by, this, by the joy, which is spiritual strength and happiness that you're feeling. And the pleasures we enjoy, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to serve the Lord. 
Pastor Adam was talking about the tithe. You know, some of you, some of you just never got hold of the tithe in this place. I don't understand, but some of you just do not want to tithe. That's your choice. Amen? That's your choice to do that. But let me tell you, to me, I recognize the pleasure and the privilege of giving to God. I've recognized for years that it's an honor, it's a joy, it's a privilege. It connects me to God with covenant. It connects me into this blessing. And I have joy and peace because I'm connected to God through covenant. And I watch people who don't tithe. And you can do what you want to do. I'm just telling you, I've watched people who don't tithe. And I watch that they don't have the quality of life I do. They, they don't have that quality of life. They have a lot of sickness. They have a lot of, have a lot of anxiety. They have a lot of pressures. They have, they have a lot of stuff going on, but they're not tithing, and they're not connected, and they wonder why all this is going on. Amen. It's just reality. It's spiritual laws. This is what works. So let me wrap this up. Solomon says, enjoy your work. Accept your lot in life, your calling and grace. This is indeed a gift from God. God will keep you so busy enjoying life that you don't have time to brood over your past. I love that. Amen? This morning, I want you to check your priorities. This morning, I want you to look into your life. Don't, don't look at someone else. I want you to see what your joy scale is like. Your peace scale is like. I want you to go back and say, how have I been making my decisions in the past? Have I been feeling pressure? Have I been trying to compare myself? Have I been trying to live up to a standard that I don't have to live up to? Amen? You need to examine your life to say, is my life, does my life line up to the Word of God? Is my life presence-driven? Amen? I wasn't going to use this scripture, but Sammy used it in a phone call last night. And I already had it written down, but I said, I don't think I'm going to go there this morning, Lord, because it's a little heavy. But then Sammy said it too. Hebrews 12, 25 to 29, this is where we're coming to. This is where the whole world is coming to. It won't be up on your screen because they don't even know about it in the back. But it says, let me go here so I get it right. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger. We will certainly not escape if we reject if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven, that be Jesus. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. The purpose of this is this means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Now, my friends, I believe we're in the last days, and this will be a fulfillment in the last days. You know, my motorcycles are fun, but they're going to be gone. My side-by-side -side is fun, but it's going to be gone. I have a nice home, but it's going to be gone. According to the Word of God, everything on this earth time is coming when it will be shaken. And only those who know the presence of God will come out of this in good shape. Amen? And many times we look and we see what's happening in the earth today. And can I just say the old rock and roll song? There's a whole lot of shaking going on. Right now it's happening. Everything is shaken. You can't rely on anything anymore. You can't rely on our economy. You can't rely on our politicians. You can't rely on anything anymore. Because everything is being shaken right now. And it's for God's love and His mercy that we will draw closer to Him. We'll do just fine as presence-driven people. 
We, the promise in Revelations is we are protected. We will do fine. We don't need a house. I don't need motorcycles. I don't need extra cars. I don't need that. But I do need my presence with the Lord. And as Sammy was speaking, I said, Sammy, you're going there. He says, it has to be said. Presence must become our priority. Must be number one. Priority in a Christian's life today. And some people don't like this message because it thinks it's taking all their fun. It's taking them out of control. My friends, you were never in control in the first place. We were never to be in control in the first place. We were always to hand our lives over to the Lord and serve Him and do whatever He said to do. We've been saved for His good pleasure. And here's the deal. God's got the best life you could ever have already planned out for you. We can go there another day. Amen? Amen? Father, I pray the Holy Spirit that your presence is here and you're talking to every person and they're seeing clearly, understanding clearly, getting your wisdom clearly, going past any words I've said, but now they're sensing, they're hearing, they're getting agreement in their hearts that this is your word and this is all true and this is your purpose this is what you're going to do hallelujah thank you father it all starts with salvation but you know here's the deal i've said this many times the gift of salvation is free true Anyone who accepts Jesus, calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. But it doesn't end there. It just starts there. And that's why church, and that's why word, that's why the Bible, that's why we're, we're to disciple and train and be trained up in the way of living for the Lord. To, so we can enjoy this great and awesome life that he has planned for us. But it does start with Jesus. You may be online. You may be on the rewatch. You might be here in person. And you may be said, I've never made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. But see, Jesus told Nicodemus, a religious leader, who came to see him in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus tried to make excuses. And four verses later in verse 7, Jesus said, Nicodemus, marvel not. I'm telling you, you must be born again. A few verses later in 16, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Jesus would not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but through Jesus the world, the people of this world would be saved. A few chapters later, John 14, 16, Jesus boldly said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can get to heaven without me. Jesus says the only way for us to get to heaven, according to the Bible, is by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So really, I always feel this is the most important part of the service, that we invite people to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to start this new life. I did this on a, I think it was a Thursday night, November 1989, watching Billy Graham on television. He said the same thing. You must be born again. Say this prayer after me. I said that prayer. I said that prayer. Went to bed. Woke up Friday morning knowing everything had changed for the better. It was amazing. I never looked back after that Friday morning. And life has been good. I tell people, no regrets. We're going to put a prayer up on the wall. We all, how we do it at this church, we say this prayer every Sunday, the end of every Sunday service. Not because we get born again every time, because you only can get born again once. But we say this because if you're here today and you're not born again, if you're online and you're not born again, if you're on the rewatch, you're not born again, then what we, we're saying is we want to give you the opportunity to say this prayer. We don't want to point you out. We don't want to embarrass anybody. We want to be a, a, a one voice across this sanctuary. But if you, if you want to say this prayer for the first time, 
or you know you have not been serving the Lord like you should, you say this prayer and make things right with God. You can, it's between you and God. The Bible says, you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. So let's say this prayer boldly together so everyone can say it. Amen? Say, Jesus, thank you for paying the price. Come on, let's say it together now. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for my salvation. I ask you to forgive me of every sin. I repent, and I'm purposing to change the way I think and live. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, help me learn about you and to grow in this kingdom lifestyle. I declare you're my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for receiving me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for receiving. Praise the Lord. Receiving us. We are born.